Hi, this is David Dyer again, and this video is the third in a series about the image of the invisible. In the first video, we talked about God the Father and how he is eternally and permanently invisible. And this is kind of a new idea for a lot of people. And so even though the invisibility of the Father is an eternal truth and something that is clearly in the New Testament, taught by the apostles and by Jesus, it's something brand new for many people. And unfortunately, there are a few verses in the Bible that are difficult to understand with this this revelation of the Father being invisible in view. Now, if you haven't watched at least the first video in this series, this video here will make very little sense to you. And so I would like to urge you to go back, take some time and watch the first video called The Image of the Invisible, and then come back and watch this video. In this video, we're going to talk about something called apologetics. It's not that we're making an apology, but apologetics means to make a reasoned explanation. And there are several verses in the New Testament that are difficult to understand, and one in the Old Testament, with the idea of the invisible Father being in view. Before we start, we have to insist upon one fact. And that is that the Bible must be consistent with itself. One part can't say one thing, another say another thing. Jesus say one thing, the apostles say another thing. It has to be consistent and coherent and all fit together. And so we are going to base our interpretations of a few <laughs> verses that seem to contradict what we're saying on the words of Jesus who said, not that anyone has seen the Father. In the words of Paul, talking about the Father who dwells in inapproachable light, who no one has ever seen or can see. In many other verses which we quoted in the first video. And upon that basis now, we're going to look at a couple verses in the New Testament that seem to contradict this, but in essence, don't really. I'm going to read from a verse in Revelation. I'm reading here from the New King James Version. This is Revelation 4, verse 3. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Well, that's funny, because there's someone sitting on this throne, and then it says, or it seems to say, that this person looks like a Sardis stone, whatever that is. A lot of primitive people, and even today, there are a lot of countries where people worship images and idols, and many of these are made out of stone. Now, it seems unlikely that Jesus declares that the Father has never been seen. Paul says that the Father can't be seen. And all of a sudden, in the book of Revelation, there he is. And when you see him, he looks like a rock. He looks like a stone idol, like all the idols of the Gentile. This seems very unlikely. Now, it turns out that this verse is not found in a couple of the very ancient manuscripts. And in the ancient Greek manuscripts is what I mean to say. And also the first part of the verse, which is, and he who sat on it, does also not appear in several old Greek manuscripts. Normally, the older the manuscript, the better and more reliable it is. There are actually some versions of the New Testament which leave out this phrase entirely. Let me tell you which ones they are. The Apostolic Polyglot Version, a conservative version, 
The modified American Standard Version by the Jewish Publication Society, the World English Bible, Wilbur Pickering New Testament, and the Complete Apostles Bible all leave out this phrase, and he who sat upon it. Therefore, this phrase or this sentence saying that it looked like a Sardis stone is describing the throne of God and not God himself. Now, to me, that seems like a reasonable explanation because it harmonizes with the rest of the scripture. I don't think God looks like a stone and he never did and he never will. And so if we choose to trust in these older manuscripts, then we find that the throne of God is described, but he himself remains invisible as it should be when we compare it with all the other scriptures. The second passage in the New Testament that might give some people trouble is the one where we read about Stephen being stoned. I'll read it here. And he, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Well, notice here that Stephen did not see God. He saw the glory or the majesty. He saw, he knew there was a being present, a glorious being present, but he didn't see him. And so this is important. He didn't violate the teachings of Jesus or the scriptures by seeing the unseeable. Now, Jesus standing on the right hand of God is an interesting expression. We in English have an expression, oh, that guy is my right hand man. Now, that doesn't mean that that guy maintains a position on my right side. Wherever I go, he scrambles to always keep on my right side. What that means is that he is the, my go-to guy. He's the guy I trust. If I need something done, he is the one that does it. And in the ancient Greek, or even probably the Hebrew culture, that's what this being on the right hand means. It means occupying a place of honor and authority. Many places in the New Testament, we read about Jesus sitting down at the right hand of the Father. But there are never two thrones mentioned in the Bible. There isn't the great big throne for God the Father, and then a little kitty throne, a little small throne for God Jr. for Jesus. Sorry, there's only one throne. And so when Jesus sits down on the right hand, it means that he takes the position of honor and authority, which the Father gives him. Jesus said in Revelation, He who overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, just as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. Now Jesus did not go and sit on the father's lap. I'm sorry. And we're not going to sit on his lap in a big pile of people reaching up to heaven. What it means is when Jesus sat down in the throne of God, he assumed the power and authority in the universe. That's what this means, for Jesus to sit down at the right hand. It doesn't mean he sat down beside the throne of God. All right, so those two verses are relatively easy to handle and to understand in a way that doesn't violate the rest of the scriptures. But in the book of Daniel, we have a, a section, a prophecy, which is particularly difficult to understand. However, there is an explanation, and it is very scriptural, if we can take a minute to listen carefully and see what the Bible is saying. I actually would like to, as long as we're talking 
about apologetics, I would like to apologize for this video because this video is an explanation. And normally explanations don't do as much of any good. The only thing they might do is assuage the doubts of someone or take care of a question. But they really don't minister Christ. They don't minister the Holy Spirit. Revelation, on the other hand, ministers something and feeds our spiritual man. But this type of critical explanation that we're doing here, unfortunately, is not very profitable in the spiritual world. But just in case someone has questions, we need to take a little time and look at these scriptures together. What we're going to be looking at is a prophecy in the book of Daniel, chapter 7. And I'm going to read here. As I looked, starting with verse 9, by the way, as I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, the hair of his head was white like wool, his throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. Okay, now who is this ancient of day? Well, it can't be the Father, because Daniel is seeing him. He's describing him. He's seeing him so clearly, he's seeing what he looks like. So that can't be the Father. And interestingly, his description combines with Jesus' appearance when he appears in the book of Revelation, in the first chapter. And so we see that who is sitting on the throne there must be Jesus. Now, he is called the Ancient of Days. But that can't be the Father also, because the Father is not older than the Son. We read in John 1.1 1, 1, that the Word was in the beginning with God. Ever since the beginning, the Son was with the Father in his bosom. And therefore, one is not older than the other. Okay, we're good. There's the Son sitting on the throne. He's going to judge the Antichrist and certain other people. But a troublesome little verse comes up later, which we're going to read. All right. In Daniel 7, 13 and 14, we read, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All the nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Well, uh-oh, who is this one like a son of man. If Jesus is on the throne, who's this guy? Now, it's interesting to note that the angel who explains the vision to Daniel tells him three times that this guy is a group of people. It's a composite person. He explains three times, and I'll read it, Verse 18, but the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. Verse 22, until the ancient of days came, that's the guy on the throne, and pronounced judgment in favor of the holy people of the Most High, and the time came when they possessed the kingdom. Verse 26, Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. 
So this one like the Son of Man who receives a kingdom is not a singular person. He is a composite person. Now this is not the only place we run into this idea in the Bible. In the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, I believe it's chapter 11. No, it isn't. It's chapter 12. Let's just read there. A tremendous sign also appeared in the heavens, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. She had a child in her womb, and she cried out, being in labor and being in grievous pain, to give birth. Then she gave birth to a son, a male, who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Okay, well, who is this male child that the woman gives birth to? Many people think that this is Jesus because he was caught up. Later it says that the woman fled into the wilderness and is nursed by God for 1,200 and so many days. Well, if this is Jesus, then the woman has to be Mary. And Mary did not flee into the wilderness after Jesus was caught up to God. How do we know this? Because in the upper room, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, she was there. And it was something like 60 days later after Jesus' resurrection. And so Mary did not flee into the wilderness. So the woman cannot be Mary, and the male child cannot be Jesus. If you read carefully, as the prophecy continues, we find out that they overcame him, which is the devil. So the man-child, or the male child, turns out to be a they. Well, how can this be? Jesus said, He who overcomes will I grant to rule the nations with a rod of iron. So Jesus is not the only one who will rule the nations with a rod of iron. A group of people called the overcomers, those who are overcoming, those who are experiencing his victory, will also rule the nations with a rod of iron. And this is the one like a son of man who appears in the book of Daniel. Also, I do not, I do not claim to be a Greek scholar, a Hebrew scholar, and even less, an Aramaic scholar. And it turns out that this part of Daniel, from which we're reading, was written in Aramaic. And so there's no chance that I'm going to be able to give you a scholarly reason for these things. However, I did find an interesting translation of this one verse, where it says that he, the one like the Son of Man, was brought before him. In the Exegesis Companion Bible, which is a literal translation of the scriptures, they say, I see in the night visions, and behold, like the Son of Man comes with the clouds of the heavens, and comes to the Ancient of Days, and they approach in front of him. Not he, but they. And so there is some doubt about the pronoun here, whether it's really a singular person who comes before the Ancient of Days, or a plural person, which is the only explanation that makes sense if we harmonize it with all the other scriptures. Once again, let me state clearly, the Ancient of Days cannot be the Father because Jesus affirmed several times, not that anyone has seen the Father, no one has ever seen God, all these affirmations in the New Testament cannot be contradicted by a single passage or verse in the Old Testament. And so let's accept in this case the explanation of the angel, who three different times tells us 
that it is the saints who come near and are given a kingdom. Just as a quick explanation here, some people might argue that this they who receives the kingdom can't be the one who is brought before the Ancient of Days because it says that all the peoples and kingdoms will worship them and object that it wouldn't be right for these people to be worshiping the saints. Well, that's the explanation that the angel gives, but also Jesus tells us that he is going to bring people who oppose us, our enemies, and cause them to worship at our feet. So there is some scriptural basis for Jesus causing other people to worship his people. Once again, let me apologize for this kind of mental analysis. I felt it necessary because some people may try to attack this precious and wonderful revelation about the Jesus being the image of the invisible God, trying to use some of these verses and undermine what God has clearly shown us. It is for this reason that I decided to make this short video and try to give at least some kind of an explanation for these three passages in the Bible that seem to say something different from the rest of the scriptures. May God bless you. Amen.